Touch wood, no, I've never had any health problems whatsoever. My son, who's 54, has had his thyroid removed, cancer. My daughter, who's 50, has had her thyroid removed. And my granddaughter has just had her thyroid removed. So that's not a coincidence, is it? This is Cold War Conversations. The British Nuclear Test Veterans Association, the BNTVA, is the charity for UK nuclear veterans. And last year, they very kindly invited me to their annual conference, where I met many veterans, including Peter Lambourne. And this is his story. Peter joined the Royal Navy aged 15. He describes those early days, including serving on HMS Wizard during the Cod War with Iceland in 1961. However, in 1962, Peter was then posted to HMS Resolution, which was the code name for the nuclear bomb testing base on Christmas Island. Peter's base was less than 20 miles away from where hydrogen bombs were being detonated, and he shares his experiences of those times. Many servicemen and islanders who were present at Christmas Island from 1957 to 1962 later reported severe health problems, which they attributed to the nuclear bomb tests, from cancers to organ failure. Whilst Peter's health has appeared unaffected, his children and grandchildren have suffered from cancers. The United Kingdom is the only atomic test nation with no official recognition or compensation to nuclear test veterans. Now, you might think there's a vast army of research assistants, audio engineers and producers putting together this podcast, but you'd be wrong. The podcast relies on your support to enable me to continue to capture these incredible stories and make them available to everyone for free. If you'd like to help to preserve Cold War history and enable me to continue to produce this podcast, you can via one-off or monthly donations. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate for more details. I'm honoured and delighted to welcome Peter Lambourne to our Cold War conversation. I was born in Dagenham. At the time, it was the biggest council estate in the world. And I joined the Royal Navy when I was 15 on the training ship HMS Ganges. And then from HMS Ganges, I was, I went to the Ark Royal, HMS Ark Royal, the old one, the big, big one, Ark Royal as a boy stoker. And from the Ark Royal, I went to a destroyer called the Wizard, which was up the Arctic for the Cod War. And then from there, I went out to Christmas Island. I didn't even know where Christmas Island was. And my poor mother had to buy a map off the Daily Mail to put on the wall so that she knew where her son was, because nobody had ever heard of Christmas Island in them days. Now, you, you just briefly mentioned there the Cod War yeah. with, with Iceland. Yeah. What, what did you, what was your experience of that? What did you see there? <sighs> we, we used to patrol all the way around Iceland, and there was a, a special ra- radio link with all the trawlers, and as soon as a trawler was being attacked by the gunboats, they just used to tap out, I don't know what the letters were, but they used to tap this letter out over and over again, and we used to go screaming towards them, and we used to try and put ourselves between us and the uh, the trawlers. The only thing wrong with that was they were so grateful that they used to give you loads of cod. Well, after about three weeks of having cod all day and all night, we was a bit. We said, "No, no, you're all right." And they used to put that beautiful fresh cod. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, lads, thanks very much, lads. Yeah. You know. And that's the only time in my life in the Navy that I ever felt sorry for the chefs because up the Arctic we're going up and down like that and the poor chefs are sitting there gutting all these fish and yeah. I thought, God, what a job, you know. Yeah. I mean, it was bad enough down the down the, the, the boiler room and engine room while you're bouncing around like that. But, yeah. But, no, that was the Cod War. <clears throat> that was 1961 when I was up there. And then, as I say, I went out to Christmas Island in 1962 
did you volunteer for that or was it it was just a post no you were it was just told to go no I'd, I'd come off the wizard <clears throat> excuse me i'd come off the wizard and i was waiting around in barracks and all of a sudden i got this draft and the actual draft i got was to hms resolution and nobody knew what hms resolution was but that was just the code name for the naval part of the boys living on the island there was only 11 of us and nobody knew and in the end this officer phoned up and he said oh he said you're going out to christmas island and i said oh thank you very much sir i didn't even know as i say where christmas island was and i, I flew out with another guy a scouser and it was brilliant because we flew by commercial flight we flew with Qantas. we went from heathrow to new york and we had breakfast when we took off okay then the refueled at new york we took off from new york to chicago and we had breakfast again when we took off because all these passengers coming on and then we took off from chicago and i said to the stewardess please can we have some? and she said yeah sorry guys she said i'll get used to because otherwise we'd have had breakfast all the way across the time zones yeah. you know we landed in honolulu and the <clears throat> the stores plane for christmas island used to come once a week and we landed on the saturday night and it used to come over wednesday and so they put us up in hickam air force base which is at the back of pearl harbor the navy base and we was there and you've got to remember this was 1961 62 and it was we're just getting over the war and austerity and everything the first day there me and this guy went into the mess mess hall and there's all these trays of steaks and the guy said to me i was an 17 and a half very hungry young lad how many steaks would you like i'd never tasted sweet corn before and i'd never tasted garlic bread before these were wonders i mean we just we just stuffed ourselves rotten me and this because we were both both un we was both under 19 years old and we just stuffed ourselves rotten all this wonderful food and the other thing i'd never seen before this is quite a terrible admission from my background they had little tins with paper in serviettes never seen them before didn't have serviettes in the navy and i said to him excuse me i said what's that for and this yank said it's to wipe your dirty mouth with your slob well i'd, I'd never i'd never seen those square things with you know yeah just never seen them before yeah but yeah and then then wednesday the guy said to us your planes arrived down the end of the runway and it's all these great big american planes and it was in those days the american equivalent of raf transport command was called mats military air transport service mm. and <clears throat> we went down there and there's all these great big planes and then at the end there's this little hastings that that was like something out of biggles and this guy in shorts and, and a jacket said are you the chap for christmas island and we said yeah and he said oh can you give it help give us a hand with the stores before you get on board so we we humped all these stores on board then when we got on board i've never seen a plane like it it was it was the shell but it wasn't lined at all you could see all the wires working and everything and we had canvas bucket seats which just hung up and me and, and they're very sore after a couple of eight hours and we're sitting there right and it took off and we're just sitting there me and this other bloke going on right. and all of a sudden this guy come down like biggles with a flying helmet on and those earphones and he said would you you had to shout because of, would you like something to drink and we said yes please and he's got a flask out all right lads yeah and we just and then he called us up and he said come up the cockpit he said christmas island's down there and it was like a little speck of yellow like a little yellow dot which was the sand and i thought how is he ever gonna land it was like a, it literally was like a little yellow dot and of course I mean, he was doing it once a week, but it was incredible. You know, just this big blue sea and a little yellow dot like that. And like that. yeah. And how, how big is Christmas Island, is it? Oh, not very big at all, no. I think it's, I think it's about 15 miles long and about five miles wide. But the five miles wide is like that. Like, it looks like a beer can opener. Mm. The five miles wide is like that. So that's all water. So the actual arms 
are only about a mile wide, you know. Right. And that's, yeah, that, that was Christmas And Island. did you know what was going on there no. at this moment? So, so no. you just thought you were being sent somewhere for something, but yes. had no idea. No of, idea at all. Of what it, what no it was. idea at all. And when I got there, the guy said to me, uh, oh, right, you're going to drive the landing craft, these little World War II landing craft. And you had two big engines, two big gardener engines, with like a deck chair in the middle, really like a deck chair in the middle. You had two levers, a head, stop, a stern, and you had two throttles. And the coxswain of the landing craft was a leading seaman. There was only three of you. There was a leading seaman, a seaman, and me, Danny Andrew. And he was up there above your head it was like it looked like if you see him on the photo it looks like a, a telephone box on the end of it right he was there once we got and you had to stay down there because it's all reefs and everything but once you got clear of the reef he used to go and i used to come up because there's no movements we're going to be going for hours mm. and we all used to, used to sit there you know there was no no amenities there was no seats or nothing we just used to find something to sit on and we'd all be going but yeah that was that's what we used to do. Yeah. But the reason we were there was because all the store, the most majority of the stores come in by ship, but the ships could not get over the reef. Uh, Christmas Island is the biggest, largest coral atoll in the world. I don't know if you know that. And the ships could have to anchor out there, and we were the, the we was the line between the ships. They used to offload into us. And then we used to run into the lagoon alongside the wolf and the Royal Engineers you were, used to unload onto the jetty. So we, that was, that was our only reason for being there, you know, the Navy. But uh, that's what we used to do. And, and so when, when did you discover what, what was going on there? What the bombs? Yeah. Right. <clears throat> all the time I was there, we never had any protective clothing or anything at all. Nothing. Um, I, it was probably a couple of days after I was there, they, they said, oh, you know, we're going to be doing a bomb. But that was the RF and the Army. Mm. We was, if you imagine Christmas Island like the beer can opener, the RF and the Army was down the middle bit, which was main camp, and right on the, the tip was the port camp, which was where the Navy was. And it was, it was a totally different world to, to, to the rest of them. We, we were sort of, we run ourselves, the Navy boys, you know. But... Um, the first atomic bomb, or hydrogen bombs, they were. The first hydrogen bomb I saw, we had to get up at half five in the morning. We all had to muster on the football field. You had to wear these great big dark glasses. You had to turn your back to the blast. And you all had to sit cross-legged on the field. And you could hear this guy. And the code word was Mahatma. And the, the tannoy used to, all over the island, you could hear it. This is Mahatma, this is Mahatma. Countdown, minus, whatever. And then it went, three, two, one, detonation. And then I would be looking right through you. I could see all, all the skeleton of your body. The guy in front, you could see his backbone, right? Through these dark glasses, you could see his backbone and everything, and it was like daylight, right? And then after about two minutes... Mahatma would say, you may now turn and look at the fireball. So you turn, and there was no stalk. It was just the fireball, right. and that's sucking that up, see. And then after another couple of minutes, he'd say, you may now take your glasses, and you took your glasses off, and you could watch sucking all this material up into the, the thing. And the thing that always struck me was the birds used to fly through it. They used to fly through the cloud, so, you know. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. But I saw, during my time on Christmas Island, I saw 11 hydrogen bombs go off. Towards the end, and this is very naughty, towards the end, the Navy boys were so blasé that the RAF policemen, who used to have to check that everybody was on the football field, used to come down the Navy lines, and we would be laying in bed, half five, and he used to say, put your goggles on, boys, and we'd say, yeah, right oh. And we just used to roll over. We just, and you'd see the, I'd right, just go a bit of light and that. that. Mm. All the others would be sitting there, the army and the air force, and all, we, we were still in bed. <laughs> you know, and that, that's what it was like. Yeah. 
But um, but there was one thing. I was talking to a guy today I'd forgotten all about. There was only one bomb that ever scared me out there, and that was called a cobalt bomb. And the other name for it was a rainbow bomb. They only ever dropped one, the British, and it didn't have a mushroom cloud at all. All it had was the whole sky when all the different colours of the rainbow. And the guy who reminded me of it this morning talking, he said, did you know that it dest- it partially, it temporarily destroyed the Van Allen belt? And I said, no. He said, all the communications on Earth temporarily went haywire for about an hour. And he said, I wasn't actually on the island when it happened. He said, I was in Honolulu and we could see it from there. Wow. But... In all my years since Christmas Island, I have never, ever, ever heard anybody talk about the cobalt bomb or the rainbow bomb, except there was a program on nuclear bombs that I watched, and it was James May. And he said, and there was another thing he said that we can't find any information on at all, called the cobalt bomb. And that's the only time I've ever heard it. You never hear it mentioned at any of these reunions, all these people with slides and that, do you? Never hear of the cobalt bomb. And that that's that was the only one that ever frightened me because the whole sky went pink, green, yellow. It was amazing. Because I think when the Americans first tested nuclear weapons in uh, Nevada, well, the first test, they were worried they were going to set the atmosphere on fire or there was going to be something there. They were, you know, really not sure what it was going to do. But, I mean, that sounds like another dimension. The guy said to me, one of the RAF blokes out there with me said... The boffins admitted they didn't actually know what was going to happen and they didn't know whether it would set off a chain reaction around the world and yet they still done it. Unbelievable. Isn't it? Unbelievable. Isn't and it? had you guys there as guinea pigs. Ah, uh, let me tell you about that. Right. Now, the idea is when the bomb goes off, the wind has to be blowing off the island because if the wind blows back, you're going to get all the contaminant right. So what you used to do is this. I'm glad this is being recorded. What they used to do is this. When the bomb was going off, all the scientists and all the VIPs on the island, all the generals and all that, they were all up the airfield. And the planes was on the airfield with the propellers going. Okay? The Royal Engineers had coaches to take as many guys as they could to the airfield get them on the planes, fly to Honolulu, which was 2,000 miles away. The rest of the people on the island were to be ferried by the Royal Navy out to the ships waiting on the horizon and taken to Honolulu best speed. Our four landing craft, which had a fuel tank about as big as this, were then to proceed independently to Honolulu. And how fast can a landing craft go? About... Eight miles an hour. And the range was about 60 miles. And Honolulu is 2,000 miles. miles. So in other words... Yeah, you... Goodbye, Jack. We're just, yeah. Goodbye. You're expendable. Well, absolutely. But I, I, I thought it was funny because we didn't carry any fresh water. We had a fuel tank like that. And we only had like a car steering wheel was the steering and me down below... It was an absolute joke, wasn't it? It was an absolute... Like, almost like saying, getting a pedalo and... Well, that and is right. To... Well, that's right. That's exactly what it was like, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, best speed, mate, best speed for Hawaii. Well, could you imagine? You know, and, and that's that's what the actual procedure was. Wow. And how far away were they detonating? The end of the island. From... So literally the end... So was that miles or...? Yeah, it, it was probably... I would say he was probably at the maximum 20 miles away, at the maximum. But after they detonated the bomb, a couple of days afterwards, the Navy boys, we used to go down to where they dropped it, Northeast Point is where they used to drop them. We used to go down to Northeast Point and all the coral had turned to glass. It, it was beautiful. I mean, all the coral was like brown glass. It was fantastic, very slippery, but we used to go down and we used to go cray fishing, fishing for crayfish. And we used to catch them, boil them up in a dustbin and eat them. 
And the guy with the runcture meter used to trace it going down. So these were radio, well, severely radioactive crayfish that, yeah, that you were eating, and they were and, beautiful. Yeah, you know, we ne- we honestly never, we were so naive, we never knew. And the other thing, everybody used to have to wear a badge, and what it was, it was a little square of plastic film with a piece of lead over one corner. And what they did, or this was the theory, they took the lead off, developed the film, and by the two differences. They could tell how much radiation your body. You had to wear it at all times, in the shower, when you was asleep, everything, right? I was talking to a guy who was a member of the clean-up party four years after I went home. He said they just put all them things in a dustbin, he said, and they just burnt them. It was just for show to make you think as though they were tracking your exposure to radiation. Unbelievable. Yeah, wasn't it? Yeah. And when I think... And as I said, all the time I was out there, I never saw a single piece of protective clothing. We used to wear sandals. We didn't even wear, the Navy guys didn't even wear underwear because it was so humid. We used to wear sandals, blue shorts, not even a shirt, and the little round sailor's hat. And that's all we used to wear. You've you've seen the photos. Yeah. That's all we used to wear, you know. And I was talking to this guy at one of the reunions. He was a Royal Engineer. And he was out there the same time as me, but then he volunteered to go back as part of the clean-up party. And he said, we went down your camp. He said, and it's all exactly how you left it. He said, we had fully rebreathable suits when we entered your huts. He said, we had sacks that you zipped up. He said, we had tweezers that we're picking your cups up, putting them in and zipping them. He said, and with the Geiger counter, he said, your cups are going the whole Hold up! Wow, you know. Wow, and when you when you you were saying that you went out to where they detonated the, yeah. what else did you see out there? I mean, was there dead birds in the water? No, nope, I never saw. Any, I never saw any dead birds or dead fish or anything like that. Yeah, what we did see, and that's why we went down there, was huge fish, and huge great crayfish. Now, whether they're mutants or what, I don't know, but they were delicious, and I mean, they really were. We used to go down there. And we used to go cray fishing. We used to have a lantern. We used to walk along. You used to have to bandage your legs up to there so that nothing could get your ankles because there's all sorts of weird stuff out there like Murray Hills and all sorts. And we used to have a lantern and we used to walk in a line along the reef and you'd see a crayfish and the crayfish would be stunned by the light and you had to grab him by the tail because the head, yeah. We used to grab it by the tail and just simply throw it in the oil drum of boiling water take it out, crack open the, the crayfish's shell and there's a tube runs from its head right the way down to its tail. You just simply take the head and the tube out and all that is meat. And it, it was absolutely delicious. Better than the cod. Oh, yeah. <laughs> God, yeah. Yeah, but so that's, that's what we used to do out there. But also, of a Sunday, I used to take... We had a, a motor fishing vessel out there, and because I was the youngest guy there, of a Sunday, I used to take the fishing vessel out with all the RAF and Royal Engineer lads who wanted to learn how to dive. And we used to take them out to the reef, to outside of the reef, not the outboard side, outside of the reef. And what we used to do, I used to go out there, there used to be a coxswain and me. I'd, I'd drive it out there down below. It was only a little gardener engine. I'd drive it out there down below. And then he would say to one of the RAF boys or, or one of the, the army boys, because it was all novel to them, he'd say, drop the anchor, and they'd drop the anchor. And then I'd shut the engines down for the day, because we was out there all day. And then he would say to me, Peter, go down and make sure the anchor's held. And I used to be the first one in the water with me diving. And I would go down and make sure that the anchor was, was held, and then me and him could sleep all day or whatever, because we knew it wasn't going. And these guys used to frolic around and... Yeah. You know, it was it, that, but that was that was just about nearly every Sunday. That was right. You know, but what else did you do in your spare time? <sighs> right, Christmas Island is a desert island. It's it's beautiful. I mean, Christmas Island is absolutely beautiful. It is like a boy's dream of Robinson Crusoe. The RAF built an airfield, which is a very sensible thing for the RAF to do. 
the army, I've never understood this, built a parade ground and whitewashed it. The navy, we built a bar, which, right, right on the point. And my job as the boy was to collect all the cigarette packets and take the silver out from them and cut little stars and stick them on the ceiling of the inside of this bar. And when you'd had a few drinks, you thought you were sitting outside of a night time. And that's what we used. That was our time off. And surely your bar was quite popular then, wasn't it? Or... It was very popular, but it was invitation only. Oh, OK. It was very popular. <laughs> but the main naffy, not the not main camp, the main naffy down Port Camp, because you still had Royal Engineers and RAF living at Port Camp, they had a great big Nissan hut. And every night, the RAF policemen used to come down and say, right, close the bar. And they all used to go outside like good little boys, close the bar. And the RAF policemen used to put a huge padlock on it like that. Right, OK, back to your huts, right? And we'd all be sitting on the sand with tins of beer. And when everybody else had gone, we used to get a bulldozer and we used to lift one side of the Nissan up and we all used to crawl underneath and we're all sitting in there in the dark. It was it was unbelievable, the Navy guys out there. It really was. Yeah. yeah. You know, we was there was 11 of us. There was about 250 Royal Engineers and there was about over a 1,000 RAF. And we was a law unto ourselves. Cause, because there was just 11 of us, they used to say, oh, leave, leave the Navy alone. Just leave them. And the, the Royal Engineers used to have a parade every morning. They had a parade. The RAF used to fall in and get to each other off. In the Navy, the first one out of bed used to pull the flag up. That's, that's exactly what it was. It was only 11 of us. Yeah. What are you going to do? As long as, the, long as the, yeah. the landing craft were running. So who was the most senior rank in, in the, the naval contingent? Uh, we had Lieutenant Commander P.A.D. Mel Hewish was our boss. Never saw him. Right. He was an excellent guy. He was a really excellent guy. And one day I'd come out of the, the RAF had the Ruffer Club. I'd come out of the Ruffer Club, rather the worse for wear, and we had bicycles. And I'm going along the road on a bicycle, and I've gone right over the handlebars, bang, and I've landed on the road right in front of this Jeep with this RAF officer in it, and he's gone berserk. And he's put me on a charge. And I had to go and see Paddy Mel Ewish, and I said, uh, excuse me, sir, I've been put on a charge by the RAF. What for? I said I was drunk, and I went, oh, okay, right, leave it to me. And I went up there, and the RAF had got... This is on a desert island. They've got policemen with white webbing on and all that. One, two, one, two, one, two. Anyway, I walked in, off caps. <sighs> right, Stoker Lamborn, uh, drunk and disorderly, sir. And Paddy, my skipper, standing there. And he said to this RAF officer, OK, he said, I will deal with this. And this officer said, well, I want him punished. And this Paddy said, I promise you that I will punish him. Anyway, the officer, they both saluted one another. The RAF guys went. Remember we were on a desert island, he said to me, right, you, five days stoppage of leave. <laughs> yeah, where are you going to go? Thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Uh, that's what it was. <clears throat> yeah. And w were you on the island constantly or did yes. you get, were you going to Honolulu? No, for... I didn't go to Honolulu. No. But um, <clears throat> we went, we went all, all different places, the Navy, because I remember there was one island I can't think of the name of it, but it was it was extremely remote Pacific Island. And they had a buoy at the end of their reef and the gas had run out. It lasted for about 10 years, right? The gas had run out and we had to go there in a landing craft and we had to replace the gas cylinder in there, little red light. To so keep... it's a navigation buoy yeah, to yeah, people it was... hitting the reef? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was built on the reef. It was like right. a little tower with this buoy. And we had to go out there by landing craft for that. Um we used to go to Fanning Island by landing craft and all different, all the little different islands like the coral reefs and that. We used to have to go around there, do stuff on there. If the scientists wanted any instruments put, we'd go, you know, to little, not even an island, just a little coral hump sticking out to sea and, and we'd, we'd go out there and they'd stick their, their stuff on it and all that. You right. Know, and we'd collect it afterwards. Right. But yeah, that's, that's what we used to do. That yeah. is basically what we used to do. Incredible. Wasn't it just, you know, and the people I've met afterwards who were out there, we didn't know anything about atomic bombs. We certainly didn't know anything about radiation, you know. Yeah. And the thing that gets me now 
is A, on my service certificate of service in the Royal Navy, I've got 1958 HMS Ganges Boys Training Ship, 1959 HMS Rally Stoker's School, 1960 HMS Ark Royal, 1961 HMS Wizard, 1962, just a big black line. Is that because the the mission was classified? Of course, yeah. It's yeah. it's just I've just got a big black line. Yeah. Nineteen sixty three HMS Manxman. Nineteen sixty. All, yeah. all right, but nineteen sixty two, just a big black line, didn't exist. And a friend of mine went to the doctors because he had a mesoloma. Is it a mesoloma? A uh, melanoma. Melanoma, yeah. and it was big, and it was the sh- shape of a coffin. And the guy said to him, and he, he's older than me, so you've got to remember my generation, he's older than me. And the doctor said to him, do you use a sunbed? And he said, oh, don't be silly. And the doctor said, do you, do you go abroad to Spain or something for your holidays in the sun? And he said, no. He said, the only time I've ever been abroad in my life was when I was a national serviceman and I went out to Christmas Island. And the doctor said to him, that's more than, my, more than my job's worth to write that down. Yeah. That was in Birmingham, by the way. Right. right. You know, so. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a very little-known story. Of, Isn't it? A relatively little-known story of the Cold War. I mean, it was interesting because I saw that there was a, an episode of Call the Midwife. I saw they... that. I saw that. Somebody phoned me up and said, record it. Yeah. I saw that about the dead. We didn't know anything about that. And can I just say... <clears throat> when Amy came down, she asked me, have you ever had any health problems? And I said, touch wood, no, I've never had any health problems whatsoever. And she said, what about your family? My son, who's 54, has had his thyroid removed, cancer. My daughter, who's 50, has had her thyroid removed. And my granddaughter has just had her the thyroid removed because apparently radiation attacks the thyroid i don't know why so that's not a coincidence is it and and i think that you know the fact that you and the other veterans were just get well you weren't even guinea pigs really because they weren't testing you to see what the effect was on you no they just didn't just... know they just literally it was just ignorance it was just pure we didn't know at all I was talking <clears throat> to another guy at another one of these reunions and he, was, he wasn't he was the pilot you've got here, but he was another pilot who used to drive through the clouds collecting samples. And I said to him, are you all right? And he said, yes, Peter, he said, I am, but all my ground crew are dead because he used to have to wait in the plane, plane until they decontaminated it and then he could get out. Well, all those guys are dead. And all the guys in that photograph you saw of me, they're all dead. Yeah. I'm the only one. And the guy who used to run the BNTV, Alan Owen, his father used to sleep literally the width of this table away from me. Okay, it was two tin lockers. One was mine facing this way. The other one was his facing that way. He used to sleep in that bed. I used to sleep in this bed. When he went home, obviously Alan's mother got pregnant and Alan was born, he died of cancer. Well, that was 51 years ago, and I'm still here. And Amy Prescott wanted to know what the difference was. We both done exactly the same job. Yeah. We was both more or less the same age. He was a little bit older than me, and there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. The thing is, is that you were exposed to radiation without your real knowledge as to what, no knowledge what the whatsoever. dangers were No there. knowledge whatsoever. I mean, you, you, you must have seen the, the films of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's right. And, and <clears throat> th- were you concerned? We didn't, or did you just trust the, you didn't, the you boffins didn't, you that didn't they were going to keep you if safe? If you were 18, from a council estate in the east end of London, on a desert island, you really didn't think about anything like that. You was just too busy playing football or, or going up the, the Navy Club. As I say, we were so innocent. That's the word. The word is innocent. We just really didn't know. We didn't know anything about it at all. Now, the problem is now 
If I catch anything now, it would be extremely hard to prove that it was Christmas Island because I'm 78 years old. Mm. And the, the government would say, oh, well, he's a 78-year-old guy. I mean, you know, he's going to expect. So that's, that's the problem. And the other problem is, as far as the government's concerned, 20 years' time it won't matter because there won't be any of us left, will it? Yeah. So and also they won't want to be um, liable that's for exactly, the descendants. That's exactly it. That is why they're hanging on because 20 years' time we'll have all fell off the end of the twig, mm. you know, mm. and it, it won't matter. Mm. That's one of the reasons why I... We had to fill in a form from the BNTV and it said, any other comments? And I just put on it, yes, get us a medal for the grandchildren. It'll be something you could hang on a photo and say, oh, my granddad was at Christmas Island. Mm. Because nobody knows about it. If you was to ask the ordinary guy in the street, what happened at Christmas Island? You know, it doesn't even exist anymore, does it? It's Kiribati. So yeah. Christmas Island is, is that one off Australia now, between Australia and Indonesia, you know. So Christmas Island doesn't even exist anymore. Mm. Yeah, well, this is why, you know, I want to talk with you and this is why, you know, I want to get this out to, to a wider audience because I think there is uh, a lack of knowledge of what happened here and this is one of the one of many travesties of, of the Cold War where, you know, servicemen and women were, were put at risk without their knowledge. proper consent. Well, without their knowledge, because yeah. we, we never knew anything at all about it, you know. Yeah, no. So if you look back on your time with, because this was Operation Dominic, wasn't yes. it? Yes. Um, that you were on there. What, what is your most memorable, you know, aside from possibly the cobalt bomb going off, what, what would you say was your most memorable or... Well, the, the thing that you you still remember either with happiness or with sadness. There. I don't remember anything with sadness. I think I remember, because there was only 11 of us, we was a really tight-knit crew. I remember that. We was a really tight-knit crew. I remember living and dying in just a pair of shorts. We used to get up in the morning and dive straight in the lagoon. You know, we yeah. didn't. It was, it was it was an unbelievable it exist. You you can't compare yeah. it, and especially coming from a council house in Dagenham to a desert island paradise, yeah. you you couldn't get your head around it. I tell you, what I did once. I went down the foreshore, and it was miles and miles of silvery sand, and for no reason at all, I just run, and I I run as fast as I could, and then I stopped. And I turned round and it was just my footprints all along. And I thought, wow, palm trees, coconuts, 18 years old. Wow. And what, what did your parents think? Of my parents didn't know anything at all about Christmas Island. I sent them a coconut. This is the crack. You sent your, your mum and dad or your wife, you sent them a coconut and you painted the coconut, the outside of the husk, and you put your name and address on and a stamp and they delivered it. The postman delivered a proper coconut, and it, apparently it nearly killed my dad trying to open it with a chisel and a hammer and goodness <laughs> knows what. But yeah, <clears throat> but yeah, that was it. And I remember my mum told me that the postman used to ask her if he could have the stamps off my letters because they were ordinary British stamps, but they was overlaid Christmas Island. Right. And the postman said, "Can I have, can I have your son's stamps?" And yeah. my mum said, "Yeah, you know." Yeah, they must have been quite rare. Very rare, I would imagine, yeah. yeah. Oh, and I'll tell you what I do remember out there, a travesty. The only building that ever caught fire at Christmas Island was the RAF fire station with the fire engine inside. It was like Trumpton. Oh, dear. You know, that was the only building that ever caught fire was yeah. the wooden fire station. Brilliant. How embarrassing is that? Yeah, yeah. God. But no, it was quite... It was quite an adventure when you was 18 years old. I mean, we all went on to other things. Everybody out there went on to other things. But it, it, was, <clears throat> it was a part of your life where, I mean, sometimes you would go on the foreshore and sit down and it was as if he was the only guy in the world. The peace and the, you know, as if he was the only guy. And it was, it was paradise and we blew it to bits. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was paradise, mm. you know. 
I always remember we had Gilbert and Ellis Islanders working with us, and I always remember talking to one guy, we used to call him Billy, and Billy told me there is no word in Gilbertese for steel. They don't know what it means. Because I said to him, don't leave your knife there, Billy. I said, someone will steal it. And he said, what, what do you mean steal? I said, well, someone will take it. He said, well, would they take it if it's not this? You know, mm. so diff totally different, you know. <clears throat> yeah. And they were such lovely people. They really were. I often wonder what happened to them. Mm. You know, these guys lived on the island. They lived yeah. in London. Their village was called London. And they lived in London, <laughs> you know. And the other village, the other side, was called Paris. Right. <laughs> Obviously, given names. Yeah, yeah. Not local names. Yeah, yeah. One was called London and one was called... And they yeah. were the native settlements. Yeah. And so where I was was called Port London. Right. You know, Port Camp was yeah. called, known as Port London. And that's where that's where I was the whole time that I was on the island. I was at Port London. Yeah. You know. But, yeah, that that's how it was. That's just how it was. See, for most of the guys here... Christmas Island was the highlight of their career. Well, for me, I'd already been all around the world before I went to Christmas Island as a boy. When I came back from Christmas Island, I then went to Aden on the Manxman, 63. 64, I was on the submarine depot ship in Malta. 65, I was out the West Indies, South America, and all around the southern states of America. 66 to 68, I was on the submarine depot ship HMS Forth, living in Singapore with my wife, where my son was born. And then the end of 68, I was up the Persian Gulf on a minesweeper called the Yarnton. Then 69, I was on a guided missile frigate called the Aurora, going around Turkey and, and, and all around the eastern Mediterranean, and then I left the Navy and went in the Merchant Navy. You know, so so yeah. Christmas Island, to me... It's just one event it in, was just, in it, a load of others. Yeah, it was just that, yeah, yeah, you know. There's further information such as photos and videos in our episode notes, which will show as a link in your podcast app. Now, this show wouldn't exist without our generous Patreons, so I want to thank one and all of them for their support you can very easily become a patreon by going to coldwarconversations.com slash donate and you can also join our facebook group where listeners just like you continue the cold war conversation thanks very much for listening it is really appreciated goodbye Thanks for listening right through to the end. I really appreciate it. And maybe check out our store and see if you can find the ideal gift for the Cold War enthusiast in your life. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash store. Thanks for listening.